uh, welcome everybody to our our last um, last uh, seminar in, in what has been so far a very exciting series of seminars uh, in technical art history and the application of advanced imaging technologies to cultural heritage objects. And uh, before Erma is introducing. Uh, our two presenters today was yet another uh, very exciting uh, topic. Uh, I just, uh, so I, I'm, my name is Franz Fischer, I'm the, the head of the Venice Center for Digital Public Humanities. And uh, this seminar series is organized uh, uh, by the center in collaboration with the Rijksmuseum and the University of Amsterdam um, uh, in Amsterdam and the computational imaging group uh, at the CWI. Uh, and yeah, that's all, that's all institutions, I think. Uh, namely with Mila Zero, um, Francien Bosema, and uh, first and uh, of all, Erma Hermans. Um, this seminar is being recorded. So if you want to get back to uh, the, the the statements, contents, and discussions, uh, you will be able to do so um, in a few days. Uh, the first three um, seminars are already online on our YouTube channel of the Venice Center for Digital Public Humanities, which you should be able to find, or maybe Lisa, if you put a, a link into the chat. Uh, we, there will be a lot of room for discussion after the presentation, so um, uh, Please stay with us uh, after the, this, uh, the presentation. Um, anything else I need to mention? I don't think so. Um, Erma, if you want to take over. Thank you, Franz. Yes, I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers today, um, both from Scotland, my, uh, my second home or my first home um, next to the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and their really interesting uh, work um, uh, that they will present. So uh, our first speaker is, is Sofia Mirashrafi. She is the Digital Project Officer on the Digital Innovation and the Digital Documentation Team at Historic Environment Scotland, based at the Engine Shed in Stirling, Scotland. Uh, she holds an MSc in Digital Heritage from the University of York and an MA in Medieval History and Archaeology from the University of St. Andrews. And currently she is working with the National Trust for Scotland on the digital documentation and investigation of Charles Rennie McIntosh Hill House in Helensboro, Scotland. Uh, I've been to the Hill House. It's a fantastic building and a very interesting uh, research is coming out of that. James Cook is a lecturer in early music at Edinburgh College of Art. After completing his doctorate on 15th century English mass cycles, James held a number of short-term postdoctoral fellowships, followed by a, a postdoctoral fellowship of the Society for Renaissance Studies, during which he worked on the apparent decline in interest in English music in the later 15th century. He works mainly on early music and is especially interested in music of the 14th to 16th centuries, the period that falls neatly between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So you might wonder how these two people um, combine their research. Uh, that's what they're going to talk about. Uh, fascinating interdiscipl interdisciplinary piece of research. So I am delighted to hand over now to Sophia, who will start with her talk. Sophia. Amazing, thank you. All right, can everyone see that okay? Yes. Me. All right, I'll get started. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, and thank you for that introduction, Irma. That was, that was fantastic. So uh, I'll walk you through what I'm planning on talking about today uh, before handing over to James for this sort of uh, joint presentation that we're doing. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself and my teams at Historic Environment Scotland uh, before walking you guys through some digital innovation projects. Uh, through case studies to show you what kinds of um, projects and the scope of the work that we do um, at Historic Environment Scotland uh, before focusing in on the, 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 the case study of Linlithgow Palace is kind of the star of today. Um, I'll start off by giving you a very brief history um, and speaking about how we 
digitally documented the Linlithgow Palace Chapel before handing over to Dr. James Cook, and he'll take you through that model and then on to um, recreating what it would have looked like um, and sounded like in its heyday. So uh, as was mentioned, I am on the digital documentation and digital innovation team at Historic Environment Scotland. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, HES is a public body that investigates, cares for, and promotes Scotland's historic environment. My team's uh, main remit is to digitally document all 336 of our properties in care and the objects that they house, uh, which is a huge undertaking because we care for everything from sites like Scarabray. You can see here, this is raw point cloud data um, that's been scanned uh, to Edinburgh Castle, to Linlithgow Palace as well, um, as well as every little coin and, and pot in our collection. Um, we document them through a number of different ways with a number of different pieces of kit. Um, for example, you can see here on the left is a laser scanner. Um, and on the right, you see me at the Hill House uh, the other week, actually, with a um, just a DSLR camera to take photogrammetry is another way of documenting sites and artifacts. Uh, what this gives us are these huge data sets. This is called a point cloud um, of this is Stirling Castle, both exterior and interior. And they're incredible snapshots in time for how these sites looked um, up to millimeter in accuracy uh, at the time of scanning. And these are incredible uh, resources, but they're very difficult to wield. They're very heavy. They take special software and special computers to look at. Um, these are some standing stones as well. So while laser scanning these sites are incredible and important, um, what interests me um, and, uh, and what we really try to push for at Historic Environment Scotland is taking these incredible data sets and taking that forward, telling interesting stories and new ways um, of, of interpreting um, our past with them. So taking this, these heavy data sets, which are very difficult to wield, what kind of things can we do with them? Uh, First and foremost, uh, they're accurate resources to use in, in conservation and site management uh, uh, within, within our organization. Here you can see Edinburgh Castle. On the left is the raw point cloud data and layered onto it is uh, color photography on the right, as well as uh, you can see that it's been uh, reconstructed um, and, and uh, to be able to, to wield easily in, in, in uh, non-specialist software and on, and on everyone's computers and, and phones as well. I'll show you later. There's 3D printing is an, uh, uh, an option when it comes to 3D data sets. This can be used to handle artifacts, which are usually hands-off for the visual impaired. It can be a way to interact with history that is not usually accessible to them. This particular case study was a Corinthian capital that our stonemasons at Historic Environment Scotland were asked to, uh, to, to carve. And instead of using traditional two, just traditional 2D uh, renderings, we were able to scan the exemplar capital and 3D print it in one-to-one -one scale so that the stonemasons could manipulate and interact with and interrogate the data. So we were using traditional or using the, the virtual and the digital to enhance and aid in traditional skills rather than replacing them, which was a really exciting case study for us. Uh, you can use it in virtual reality, which again, we'll see in the latter half of this presentation. This is an incredible way of giving access to sites like this, um, uh, Queen Chambered Cairn in Orkney, uh, because Orkney is difficult to get to, but also it's difficult to, even if you're there, enter the cairn. You have to crawl through this uh, narrow entryway, uh, which is not uh, feasible for everyone. So virtual reality gives folks access to sites um, that they may not have had access before. Uh, Hill House was mentioned. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the Hill House uh, is taken care of by the National Trust for Scotland. It's one of Charles and A. Mackintosh's uh, greatest and most complete works. Uh, it's in Helensburgh, Scotland, and was completed in 1904. Uh, 
it's suffered from damp ingress almost from its conception due to the materials that it's made out of and also the, the, the classic Scottish weather beating down on it with wind and rain. Uh, the National Trust has placed it in a protective box and has asked us at Historic Environment Scotland to come and scan it, um, which we have. This is a 3D model of the site from 2018. But we've also layered on thermographic information on top. Now, what's interesting about combining thermal imaging and 3D space is that you can start to holistically view how damp is moving throughout the building. You can see uh, the blue, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the, the blue uh, chimney there, that's where damp um, has been uh, sort of gathering um, in that area of the building. But when you twist the uh, 3D model around, you can see how that chimney is actually speaking to these parts of the inside of the house in a way that 2D uh, thermal imaging can't really speak to as, as eloquently or as effectively how these different parts of the house um, are speaking to each other in terms of how the moisture is moving through them. Uh, additionally, we can layer on further information through archival imagery. So these images projected onto the model were taken in 1972. And what's interesting about this example is that that problem Jimmy that I was talking about didn't actually exist in the 70s. Um, and the facade on the south face is also different. So by layering these like vast amounts of information together onto this 3D space, you can start to tell more complex stories about the past of these sites and, and it can help us inform how to take care of these sites moving forward. It's one of my favorite case studies. Moving on, uh, you can put this data into a gaming space, which kind of speaks to what we're talking about today as well. Because, for example, Bar Hill Fort on the Antonine Wall is a series of lumps and bumps archaeologically. So very difficult to understand how it may have looked um, at the time of its use. But in a gaming space, uh, um, space. You can place buildings, people, artifacts back in situ, and you can start to interrogate um, the heritage, which is a really effective way of, of conveying a story. We've been working on on-site interpretation with our, with our virtual assets. Uh, this example is uh, at Edinburgh Castle. The forewell has been scanned by lowering a man down into the well, which is a nightmare, um, but it did give us this excellent data set um, of the entire four well at Edinburgh Castle. And now when you go and visit, you can actually scan a QR code and virtually dive into the depths um, below the castle, which you wouldn't have done, um, would have been able to do otherwise when you go and visit. You can also uh, show how items may have looked in the past. Again, we'll touch on that later. Um, this is at Stirling Castle. This statue would have been painted and so in the virtual space, you can convey how things might have looked um, in their heyday. Uh, virtual access, uh, similar to what I was talking about with Orkney, uh, you can broaden online access to sites and artifacts uh, to a much wider audience um, than you can in, in the real world space. So this is, again, Edinburgh Castle on a site called Sketchfab, which uh, we're huge proponents of at Historic Environment Scotland. For those of you who aren't aware, it's like YouTube for 3D models. It's used a lot by gamers and artists, but a growing number of cultural heritage spheres are, are putting their artifacts and sites online for folks to um, be able to interact with um, in, in 3D space. These are some of our more, more popular um, models. There's Edinburgh Castle, Queen Chambered Cairn, uh, the Forwell, and Bar Hill Fort, all of which I've mentioned. You can go and, and, and play around with that um, at... Um, on our Sketchfab page. Uh, and the last case study I'll touch on before going on to Lynn Lithgow is one where we dabbled a bit with sound, but instead of the past, we tried to evoke what it was like to go visit Musa Brock in Shetland at dusk. So the sound, which you can most likely hear gently in your ear, other than my voice, is the sound of the storm petrel birds that roost in this brock. And it's silent during the day, but at dusk, it starts to come alive. So we took our 3D um, sound recording uh, kit and we were able to record it um, when we went to visit. So when you see this model on Sketchfab, you'll be able to hear the, the waves and the birds uh, around you. 
Okay, so that giving you a very whistle-stop tour of the kinds of things that my team does at Historic Environment Scotland will focus in on the beautiful case study of Linlithgow Palace. And I'll give you a very brief introduction and forgive me as I read from my other screen because it's not my specialty, but it is one of my favorite sites that we take care of. Um, so Linlithgow Palace Chapel, um, or uh, Lithgow Palace, was one of the major royal residencies of the Stuart dynasty, and it was chiefly used as a pleasure palace um, midway between the royal castles at Edinburgh and Stirling. It was built over like a wide variety of phases, but it's a 16th century palace. There's no drawbridge or anything like that, so it really was purely um, for pleasure, not for defense. Uh, as it stands today. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. But in its heyday, it would have been, it would have had harling and lime wash and uh, rooftops and turrets and statues and stained glass. So it's similar to the uh, sort of archaeological sites. It's it's difficult to fully imagine how spectacular this place would have looked um, in its use, full use. Uh, both James V and his daughter Mary, Queen of Scots, were um, born here. And it's one of the most important later medieval buildings in Scotland. Uh, today, we're going to focus in on the chapel, which you can see beautifully boxed in in white, uh, and how we laser scanned that before talking about how we recreated it with, with Dr. Cook in the latter half. So from palace to points, creating a model, this is the raw data set of, of Linlithgow Palace Chapel. And uh, how you scan a site is relatively simple. You take your laser scanner and you place it in as many overlapping places as possible to get every nook and cranny of the site. The scanner works through line of sight. So if it can't see it, it can't document it. So you can see the two raw scans on the screen here and an example of how exquisite the detail can be up to millimeters. So this is all raw data and you can almost read the sign on the wall. So when you have then all of your scans, you tie them together in a special piece of software, something called cloud to cloud registration, where you tell the software corresponding points and it ties it up all nice and tight into one master point cloud. Uh, the scanner that we used also took color photography, which you can see on the top, it's the same data set, uh, but not very good photography, you won't get a, a photorealistic finish. So what we did it, um, additionally is took uh, photography on top of that color photography with a DSLR to project that onto the model. Uh, once that's all done, we, we tie it together to make a, uh, a, a watertight mesh is what it's called, basically connecting the dots of the point cloud. But what that gives us initially is a really big, heavy mesh, which again, is difficult to wield. So you borrow gaming techniques. So when people make video games, it's the exact same workflow. You take that heavy data set and you optimize it so that it's easier to wield in virtual reality and, and gaming software, which James will talk about in his presentation. Layer that on with the beautiful photography and we get something like this. Uh, these are a couple snapshots of the model um, at the end of the end of its life, um, but this is how the palace looks today. Uh, still really beautiful, but again, just a hint of hints of what it of what it could have looked like before. Um, and this is from here. So this is where I will stop in the story, and I'll hand it over to to Dr. Cook. But if you have any questions, these are my details up on the screen, um, and, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, but Stay tuned as, as I hand it over to James. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about sort of what, what we did with the point cloud data and where we went. Um, essentially, this was all part of a project called Space, Place, Sound and Memory, Immersive Experiences of the Past. Um, which was quite a collaborative project. Uh, it, it was led by myself as the PI. Co-I, um, Kenny McAlpine is now in 
uh, Melbourne, uh, so it's quite international. I think we've got a couple of other people who are involved with the project in the audience at the moment. There's um, Rod Selfridge, who was our postdoc, uh, who's now in Sweden. Um, and I think I saw Steve Comer as well from Sir Lewis Heritage, who helped us with some of the uh, the visuals um, and some of the interaction as well from Glasgow. So, um, oh, and of course, the Bajwa Consort and their conductor, who is at Birmingham University. So um, it was quite a big project in terms of a lot of moving parts and bringing things together. Um, essentially what we were aiming to do was to try to get some sense of performance as experience. Um, so this was partly to do with this being an em embodied um, thing really, so performance as an embodied experience, it's to do with people and places. Uh, and this idea of place became more and more important for the project. So part of this was to do with the sort of multimedia spectacle of performance. This idea that particularly 15th, 16th century music that, that I deal with a lot um, was really intended as part of a full multimedia spectacle. This, this reconstruction, physical reconstruction um, of an early 16th century um, church here, parish church shows that quite nicely. This isn't a particularly uh, extensive or, or um, expensive example here but it does show that that most of the musical performances you would have heard in the sacred context were highly decorated in many different ways uh, in essence the sort of saints we have here um, elaborated in uh, pigment or elaborated in architectural aspects or elaborated in sculpture are exactly the same saints that we have elaborated in sound. Um, so the music kind of was designed to be part of a full multimedia experience and you don't really get that through most concert settings and certainly not through CDs. Um, and another really important aspect of it was to do with acoustic and this idea that composers of the past were writing music for a particular kind of acoustic um, and that that acoustic certainly in the UK is not really well represented by the way that the buildings currently survive. That's probably not quite the case in some other parts of Europe, um, but I think there are very, very few buildings even standing now um, which accurately portray the kind of sounding space that we would have had. Um, so yeah, the, the project was basically uh, designed initially to, to try and explore this idea of performance in spaces. And to do that, we wanted to use virtual reality reconstruction. Uh, part of this was because that allows you to do sort of multimedia aspect in a nicely embodied way. Um, the screen, the interpolation of the screen is slightly different. Sort of the idea of diegesis, what, what feels like you're watching something and what feels like you're in something is, is very different with virtual reality. But it also allows you to explore the space quite nicely. Uh, one of the big differences, of course, sort of post-Victorian period in the UK is the interpolation of pews within sacred space make things quite different. Um, we wanted to use VR to allow you to, to really explore a space without views, with, with all of those kind of extra interpolations removed that allowed you to move around the space, uh, hear the spatiality of the sound. Um, once we've done all of that, we wanted to be able to place historically informed performance within these reconstructed spaces and really see what that did. The project actually um, wasn't only focused on Linlithgow Palace. I'm going to talk almost exclusively about Linlithgow Palace, but for completeness, I will mention the other place as well. Uh, Sophia has already mentioned um, the, the status of Linlithgow Palace as a royal space. It's got a chapel royal, so it was of interest to us, um, but also as, as a pleasure palace. Um, part of the reason that we were attracted to it as a project team um, was because it's quite badly ruined. It was almost more attractive to us than, say, trying to reconstruct Stirling, which is um, physically reconstructed already. Um, and the other attraction, of course, was working with Historic Environment Scotland, given that they do have such a great team that do all of this kind of thing anyway. Um, the other space that we looked at was St Cecilia's Hall, which is owned by, by the University of Edinburgh, of which I'm a part. Um, and this is the oldest purpose-built concert hall in Scotland. It's still a working concert hall now, but it looks very, very different to how it once did. That's about as much as I'm going to say about St. Cecilia's, but if anyone wants to know about the project from that angle, feel free to ask. Um, okay, so the VR development, oh, that, that's our, the co-I there, um, pairing one of the headsets um, in Manchester, I think, um, demonstrating this at the Manchester Science um, Exhibition. So yeah, you've already seen here, First stage was indeed LIDAR scanning. Um, and as Sophia mentioned, the amount of data we got from that made things a little bit impractical. We were very keen that we would be able to provide something for Historic Environment Scotland to be able to use on site. Uh, 
and that means not using a supercomputer. Um, and anything that you're doing with um, sound and movement, live acoustic processing, plus point cloud data, gets quite big and processor intensive. Uh, so we had to simplify things a little bit. As Fia said, here is a simplified version. Um, reducing polygons. Uh, this is just a video. You've seen some of the images of it, but this is, this is um, rendered out uh, in some of that gaming technology that's been already mentioned. So we, we, we ran this through both Unreal and Unity. Uh, this is the space of the chapel in the present day. As you can see, we have not built any of the rest of it. If you walk through any of the doors, you fall into eternity, uh, which is not what happens if you're actually on site. Obviously, that would be very dangerous. Um, so that's the it in the past. What we really wanted to do was uh, go some way towards re constructing it in the past. Um, we ended up doing both past and present. You get music in both and you can move between the two states. We thought that was quite uh, instructive for people to be able to see what a difference changes in acoustic makes and also what a difference a change in the sort of multimedia projection of it makes. Um, this is uh, an illustration from one of Historic Environment Scotland's artists. Um, we worked with them, we worked with, with some of their specialist historians, um, art historians, standing building archaeologists. Uh, we worked with the archival record as well. I spent a lot of time looking through um, what, what was uh, essentially listed um, in the accounts to see what kind of materials were used. Uh, and we also looked at uh, the archaeological record, what things survived there. Once we've done that, we were able to uh, start to identify objects and materials and start to reconstruct something of what we think it might have looked like. Um, so the original modelling of this was done by, by Rod Selfridge and then um, so Lewis, uh, uh, Heritage really helped us to make this look a lot nicer, uh, improving the shading, the lighting, um, and putting in some of the more complex objects as well. Um, see, we've got the Carver Choir book there um, on, on the lectern too, which is nice. Um, so that's the sort of visual aspect. Um, we were very, very keen to have acoustic reconstruction as part of this. Uh, lots of people have done acoustic reconstruction in isolation. Lots of people have done visual reconstruction in isolation. We really wanted to try and bring these together, uh, which again has been done before, but taking that one step further and doing it in virtual reality added that sort of additional uh, layers of complication. Um, in order to get our acoustic model, we, we basically needed to work out how the sound was going to behave in the space. So for instance, as I talk now, um, sound is going directly um, to I suppose this is a very bad example because it's going directly to the microphone, which is very, very close to my mouth indeed. Uh, but it is also, I suppose, bouncing off the floor and off the ceiling to the microphone. Um, so what you are getting is uh, direct sound plus echoes, reverberations. Um, and we can map that quite nicely and we can also turn it um, into something that we can input into software in order to apply um, a rendering of an acoustic on top of things. Um, we were very keen to make sure that we had a way of testing how effective that had been. Uh, this is one of the nice things about using St. Cecilia's Hall as well, in that we could reconstruct that as it looks currently and run essentially the same experiment in virtual reality and in reality. Uh, so here I am for some reason looking down a microphone. I'm not quite sure why I was doing that, but I am. Um, and this was as we did a sign sweep um, in St. Cecilia's Hall. Essentially what this does is, is run through a lot of frequencies so you can see how each of those frequencies behaves in the space. Um, and you can then model that in, um, in Odeon and use that to compare with the same um, experiment that we ran in virtual reality. We did also try to do this in the Lithgow Palace, uh, but it was made rather more difficult by the fact that it's full of bats and the bats get quite upset when you play extremely high pitched noises at them. Um, so in the end, we you did our scientific testing on the St. Cecilia's model, uh, working on the principle that we had proved the methodology there and that it would work um, in Lynn Lithgow. Um, so how do we get that model? The first thing we need to do is work out the materiality of as much of the internal space as we can. Uh, once we've done that, we can get a sense of how all of these materials absorb and reflect different frequencies of sound. 
and then Paul Rod had to go through and tag all of the surface spaces uh, with its with their materiality so that we could um, work out how sound would have reacted in that space. Um, Odeon is quite good for visualizing this. Um, I should hasten to add that this is vastly slow down. Um, obviously sound does not move this slowly or indeed as billiard balls, but this does at least show how the sound reflects around the space. This is our reconstruction in the past, in other words, with a roof back on and with glass. You can see there, move from the sound source, we're hitting the ceiling, we're moving back. The colors change as uh, we have a greater number of reflections. Uh, but we can see no sound lost there. Um, it's kind of bouncing around the space quite effectively. Um, might compare that with what that looks from on top. And again, you can see here how you're getting a sort of a much delayed reflection from down the far end and sort of travels in waves, for instance. So you can probably imagine how that is going to sound in reality. We can compare that, for instance, um, with our reconstruction of the palace as it is today, which is quite a different experience. As you can see, a lot of the sound is coming out simply because there isn't a roof. Um, and you see much the same here again. We get some reflection around within the window um, alcoves, but some is still lost simply due to the fact that there isn't any glass. Um, okay, so essentially we had two outputs from our project. Uh, one of those was a virtual reality um, implementation used via headsets, um, application would be a better word there, um, used via headsets, which was designed for Historic Environment Scotland to be used by visitors to Linlithgow Palace. Uh, we're very keen to get give people both a sense of um, the magnificence of the building as it once was. Um, it seems quite common in representations of medieval and Renaissance Scotland uh, to use very drab uh, ruins. If any of you seen Mary Queen of Scots recently, um, or the, Robert, the recent Robert the Bruce movie, it's all filmed on site in Scottish buildings, which are ruins, um, giving an impression that Scotland just built ruins and then inhabited them for some reason. Uh, so we were very keen to give people a sense of what it would have once been. And the other thing, which which is often the case, almost always the case, I think, in heritage sites, is that there's no sound. Um, and as a sound historian, I'm interested in trying to reclaim that for people. So we we're really keen that we could develop something that worked on site, gave people a fun experience that could still make them think a bit about acoustics, think a little bit about these sounding spaces and think a little bit about the visuals as well. Um, we also made a CD recording, what we believe to be the first commercially produced um, classical CD recorded and produced entirely in virtual reality. Uh, and that uses our virtual acoustic um, to, to give something which is quite different. Um, obviously very different outputs and we had to handle them in very different ways. For the virtual reality project, we used uh, Google Resonance, Steam VR audio plugins. Uh, the reason for that is we're really keen to get a sense of spatiality, people being able to move through the space um, and really being able to come up and sort of occupy the space of singers and hear a particular singer uh, and see what it feels like to be in different parts of the room. Um, Odeon isn't particularly good for that. Odeon's very, very good acoustic software, uh, but that's much better for static um, uh, static sound sources and static points of audition. Um, so we, we we did various tests on uh, the plugins uh, and and worked worked with the best things that we had there. Essentially, the way that they work is they they do sort of sound probes throughout the room, work out what the acoustic is in certain points, and then sort of cross fade between them in such a way that you can't really tell. It's a slight fudge um, to make up for having to make it work. Um, with relatively low processor power uh, and being able to move through the space, um, but it still gives a very good uh, good rendering. Um, the CD, we were able to use Odeon because CD, you don't move. Uh, we just had one, mic well, one microphone array set up in one place and um, you have, this is where the listener is, this is where the musicians are, nice and easy. Uh, so for that, we're able to be very, very confident indeed about the reconstructed acoustic that we've got. Um, once we got our acoustic, we then needed to record our music. Uh, to do that, we recorded in an anechoic chamber. Um, so you're possibly more familiar with these from things like testing jet engines and um, testing how uh, speakers work. 
they're mainly used by engineers and physicists rather than musicians for good reason um, but it has the advantage of having virtually no echo what that means of course is that we can reconstruct an acoustic and we don't have to worry about having our reconstructed acoustic with the acoustic of a, um, a recording studio imposed on top of it. We've just got the one. Um, for the VR representation, we close mic to all of our performers so we could get individual spatialization. Um, that made things a bit difficult in that we had to find clever ways to make sure they could still see each other and you'd still get some kind of degree of musicality and musicianship of interaction between them. Um, we were able to do that slightly differently for the CD recording because given that no one could move, it didn't matter quite so much about that degree of spatiality. Um, the anechoic chamber is a very unnatural environment from which, uh, within which to perform. Uh, you can sort of hear the blood in your ears. It's odd, very, very odd. It's also very claustrophobic. Um, it gets quite hot. It doesn't make you feel good about your voice, I suppose, is one way to put it. Um, if any of you have sung, you'll probably find that singing in the bathroom or in a cathedral, spaces that have extremely large amounts of, of reverb, make you feel good about your singing. It hides a multitude of sins. Um, it really does help to, uh, to, to downplay any issues with intonation. You can't really hear problems um, with, with you know, missing, um, uh, misaligned syllables, and it covers a lot of misalignment in terms of rhythm as well. Uh, an anechoic chamber is the absolute opposite of that. If you do anything that is not perfect, it's extremely obvious. Um, so it was very, very hard to perform in there. And we had to develop interesting new production streams really to make it work. But I think we got quite good with that in the end. Um, once we've done that, we individual stems that we had to edit together. Um, this was less of the case with the CD recording, but certainly for the VR, given that we wanted to be able to have avatars of singers and the music coming from them, we had to essentially split everything up. Um, so yeah, that was how we recorded the music. We could then basically in, uh, apply our reconstructed acoustic on top. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of, uh, of the VR um, patient now. Hello and welcome to our virtual reality reconstruction of the Chapel of Linlithgow Palace. In this VR experience... Here, here, we're getting very close to the bass, so he's much louder. And you can see the difference that makes to the acoustic. We're losing so much sound through the roof. Was that there? Um, so, I suppose some aspects of that, um, various parts of the way that, that we built that so that it would work um, on site in a heritage space um, uh, were, I suppose, different to how we intended on making it work. Um, Steve's team came up with a wonderful solution to the fact that we, we had assumed we would be using um, handheld triggers to enable us to pick things, move between past and present, move between the English and the Gaelic version. Um, however, there are obvious issues and, and they had experience of having issues with people running off with the handsets and this causing problems. Um, so they created for us a sort of visual reticule. So essentially everything works just through your eyes. You look at the things you want to touch. Um, so 
we, we work with that in different ways. We change the way that, that you could move around the space again to make it easier uh, for people who maybe have never used virtual reality before. So um, it's, it's come out slightly different from what we were expecting. I, I've got a version um, using wired headsets, which is a bit more high powered uh, that I use at university for teaching sometimes uh, where I don't have to worry about random people walking through and falling over things quite so much. Um, but I'm very happy with what we've ended up with and I think it's a great user visitor attraction um, which which still has some important teaching points. <clears throat> I mentioned a little bit there about the different acoustics I thought it might be instructive just to take from our CD recording uh, just so you could see what they sound like. This is a recording directly from the anechoic chamber. Um, it's horrible by the way this will make your ears bleed um, but this this is what we were working with kind of raw. <laughs> Okay, um, this is our reconstruction of the past acoustic. Um, so this is, this is from the turn of the 16th century with the roof back in. Um, you'll notice this is a lot more intimate a, a, an acoustic than you would be used to for this kind of recording. This isn't a giant booming cathedral recorded right in the center. This is a small side chapel, royal chapel, like we would hear most of this music in with a lot of soft furnishings. So very, very different to what you're expecting, uh, but also very, very different to the anechoic version. And I'll just play a short bit of this, um, but this is the reconstructed present acoustic. So this is what this would sound like if recorded directly in the Lithgow Palace Chapel as it currently stands with no ceiling, no windows. Obviously much closer to the reconstructed past acoustic than it is to the anechoic, uh, but you'll hear the difference um, having a ceiling has. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's just, just a little bit from the CD to, to, to demonstrate what, what we've done with the acoustic there. Um, I suppose essentially that this project was very much about fragments. The building is a fragment, but the repertoire is as well. Um, so the this is a slate um, found in the drain of an abbey, which represents 
uh, most of the surviving Scottish music of the 15th century, um, which is what, 15, 15 notes there, something like that, maybe 20. Um, it's uh, a fairly badly damaged repertoire. Um, and that obviously makes a bit of a challenge when you're trying to find historically appropriate music for these spaces. Um, but I think it also makes this project quite important in that we want to show that there was music, even if not that much of it's survived, and that it was really good as well, which I think is important. Um, I think that's a, a sort of an important historiography around um, the cultural products of Scotland, which are often denigrated to an extent. Our approach to this uh, was to try and take a snapshot of time. So for the virtual reality version, we picked Easter in 1512. We know James IV was there for the birth of his son, James V, who was baptized in the chapel um, following mass on Easter Sunday. We know James IV heard mass on Easter Sunday before then. Um, we exploited the fact that Scotland followed the same liturgy as England. So it followed Sarum. Um, and because of that, we know that they would have used Sarum chant and we have plenty of English copies of Sarum chant. So we were able essentially to borrow chant uh, monophonic material that we knew was appropriate from non-Scottish sources, but which we know would have been performed definitely at that time in the chapel. Um, we then also exploited, uh, I suppose, a bit of a thought experiment of what would you do if you were an early 16th century um, chapel director and you only had some chant on you, you didn't have any polyphony, but you needed a little bit more magnificence. Well, what you would do is you'd use Aussie improvised polyphony. Um, so that's what we did as well. We followed um, the techniques as outlined in the Scottish Anonymous Treatise um, and essentially created some phobodon, uh, which is basically improvised homophonic polyphony around the chant. So again, we know it's liturgically appropriate. We know it's the kind of chant that they would have used. And we also know this is the kind of process they would have used if they needed to create polyphony when they didn't have it on them. Um, so we were quite happy with that. We then took a little bit more of a leap uh, and used something which was not so liturgically appropriate, um, but largely because we wanted to explore what polyphony sounded like in this space. Uh, and our rationale for that uh, was that we used material that from the Carver Choir book. The Carver Choir book um, is believed to have been uh, related to the Chapel Royal at Stirling. And we know the singers from Stirling were the ones who came and performed at the chapel in Linlithgow. Uh, so we know, we know that even if this music wasn't necessarily performed in the chapel at Linlithgow, it was at least performed by people who did perform in the chapel at Linlithgow. So we thought that's not too much of a stretch. Um, so we're a we took a couple of mass cycles from there as, as our, our main material. Um, we picked some that were from the earlier period. Most of the material in it is a bit too late for what we're looking at. So we selected two anonymous mass cycles, uh, which are clearly 15th century in origin, uh, and which I've elsewhere argued are actually Scottish. Um, they've generally held to be of continental origin, which is absolutely impossible. They're definitely either English or Scottish, um, and I'm very much leaning on the Scottish side at the moment. Um, so we used uh, Kyrie from one of those, uh, which, is, which is actually what you've just heard um, earlier. Uh, for the CD, it was slightly different. Essentially, these two outputs came as part of our HRC funded follow-on project. Um, as I said, two outputs, one was the CD, one was the VR um, application. For the CD, we chose a slightly different approach, uh, largely because we wanted a bit more polyphony uh, for, I'll be honest, largely commercial reasons. It sells better. Um, and I think we, we were more interested in it artistically, I suppose. Um, we aimed for music that was appropriate for about between 1503 and 1513, uh, that being the period between which the chapel was built and before the big organ um, was, was put in there, essentially. Um, which would have changed the acoustic rather drastically. Um, so we use in we actually recorded two of the mass cycles, both the mass cycles that I spoke about. Um, however, I messed up the timings and that meant we had essentially two CDs worth of music. So we've only included one and we will probably reduce the, uh, release the other as a second CD at some point. Um, so the, the main bulk of it is what, what I've taken to calling the Catherine wheel mass. Um, it, it was generally, thought to be um, a sine nomine mass, a mass without, uh, without any chant origin, uh, but I recently discovered that it's, it's based on chant for St. Catherine. Uh, around that, we basically then built 
a service for St. Catherine using Chant and Phobodon um, and a Magnificat again from the Carver Choir, Carver Choir book. Uh, so all of this material is kind of appropriate for a celebration of St. Catherine, uh, who we know was one of the favoured saints of James IV as well. We recorded all of this in an anechoic chamber, as I said, uh, and then released it with that reconstructed acoustic. And it also comes with a downloadable app, which, which Rod built, um, which allows the user to select either the past or the present acoustic um, and shows you a little image of, um, of what it looks like. OK, I think that's probably enough of me going on about the project. Um, happy to answer any questions. I'm also just going to plug the CD because um, why not? So shameless plug, buy the CD. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sophia and uh, James. Oh, that was really fantastic. Thank you for these wonderful pictures and for the music, James. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I want to buy the, the CD. That's fine. <laughs> So, um, so we now have uh, uh, time to, to discuss, ask questions. Some discussions have already been executed in the chat. Uh, I don't know if uh, you, Sophia, or um, uh, Zemilla want to just uh, inform uh, the audience about what, what you discussed here. Uh, so the floor is open. You are, you are, everyone is invited also to put on the, the video if you don't mind. Uh, so it's always nicer to see the people uh, um, participating, so that's fair to the presenters uh, who has been exposed here to the an unknown audience, or well, some are very well known here. I see, so very nice audience. Okay, so uh, please uh, raise your hand or uh, put your name in the chat or uh, type uh, key or your questions in, in the chat, and uh, then uh, Erma and I uh, we will uh, try to keep the order and not overlook anyone here. Uh, yes, then maybe I can uh, yeah. move ahead because Please. I was uh, very fascinated uh, by your uh, talk. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Sophia and, uh, and James. It was really interesting. Um, and um, since I daily work with meshes and vertices and points, I was wondering in the chat, um, I, I asked in the chat uh, which software uh, does she use and uh, if any, what kind of post-processing she uses um, for irregularities or even to uh, downscale the complexity of the model because I myself have this <laughs> difficulties in when I do the rendering and I would like to see my implementations on screen. I'm just wondering if you implement any post-processing. Um, yeah, I, I might like verbally answer this as well because I was like taking forever to type it and I was like, I don't know how to say this distinctly, um, but I can verbally. So um, yeah, it's, it's a huge deal when dealing with 3D data is getting it to a usable size. Um, and this was done in 2018, 2018, geez, I think, I think it was. So back then, um, obviously software in this industry moved so fast. So we couldn't do all of it in reality capture, which was the main piece of software that we did to combine the scans and the images. Um, so we did a bit of a dance of software. So you bring it into reality capture and it meshes it together export it out into a different 3D modeling software. Uh, we use 3DS Max um, to kind of decimate it. There was a, um, we used Instant Meshes as well, uh, which is an open source software. I can give you all of these um, software that we use, but it, there's no one correct way to do it. Um, there's, there's always going to be people that have different ways of doing it. Blender is the open source alternative to um, uh, 3ds uh, 3d studio max so it it just depends on on your own workflow i'd be interested to see what you get on but then even then as james was saying so we decimated it to an extent but even that was probably i don't know a million polys and that's too big for for gaming software to do it elegantly so then you would remodel it over over the top of the uh the uh 3d point cloud software that was that was decimated to a million so those were those big squares that you saw in James's presentation where that was just in either Blender or 3ds Max, um, that would have been done on top of it. And then the textures projected um, onto the, to the simpler model. But uh, I think it kind of speaks to um, 
not really, but it, 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 it echoes what, what Mike Toth was just, had just mentioned in the chat saying, um, in our post COVID virtual environment, we're dependent on bandwidth networks and users, users infrastructure to receive and interact with quality data. Um, so with the visual, the, the easier it is to wield on as many um, people's phones and, and computers as possible, the more accessible it's going to be. Because it's true that just because you put it online doesn't mean that you're automatically making it accessible to everyone. There's, there's work that needs to be done to it um, on, on our part um, in order to make that um, available to as many people as possible. So yeah, thank you for that question. That's a good one. Thank you Mike, does this uh, already answer your question? Mike, nice to see you. You're in the audience, are you still there? Mike, Mike Toad? Ah, something slipped me. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <Hi. laughs> Sorry, just juggle it. Here. Hey, thanks so much, Sophia. Uh, we deal with uh, image, you know, big amounts of image data. You're dealing with audio data. I was thinking as uh, I was listening, it's like, well, I'm dependent on, you know, on, on the network, on what's coming through here. And even our audio breaks up while we're just talking. Exactly. Here. Compressed. So yeah. what am I getting versus what you're presenting? Even, yeah, even because I, I mentioned we did QR codes on site. That was one of our big kind of pushes in the past year when folks weren't allowed on site and when they weren't allowed access to different parts of sites when they were partially open, um, we kind of resurrected the QR code. Um, but even then we have, we were going to link to our Sketchfab models, but then that takes people's data on their phone and, and battery on their phone as they're walking around. So we actually did YouTube videos of 3D models and it, like the kind of compromises that you have to make, sometimes they're not the most elegant, um, but it, it, it does need to be um, placed at the, at the forefront. I'm not sure sound isn't my um, expertise, uh, but in terms of the visual, it's, it's a battle, um, but it's important to keep it at the forefront of the conversation. Well, also, I, I think you, you hit on a key word, the compromise, and you mm. don't want to compromise. You've done all this work to create this wonderful data with uh, anechoic chambers and everything. You don't want to compromise that. So you need to keep your gold standard data, you know, maybe for future generations. For Absolutely. One, that, you know, one day the audio systems can handle it. Um, but maybe, you know, you have a compressed version yes. online, but yes. how, what, what's your trade space and how you address it? I think that's a question we're all trying to deal with and, and you hit on it with how do we compromise, but how do we not lose all that great work and how do we yeah. preserve it? Yeah. I think stealing from the gaming industry as well, because that that's a workflow they do all the time. You can get gorgeous scenes that can render in seconds. Um, in, in, in sort of video games and things like that. So the more we can learn the, from other industries, the better. It's the death of us if we just focus in on heritage. I think that this is a beautiful project of so many disciplines coming together to create such an elegant result. And oh my gosh, James, we could have just sat and listened to that music <laughs> for like an hour and I would have been so happy. <laughs> like just, just incredible things that when you take from as many different disciplines. And I think that you don't necessarily lose if, if you if you fully take the lessons that we learn, like you can get such crisp, sharp imagery with, with a, a dumbed down model, as it were. I don't think you really lose anything if you have the textures and the normals and the sound. I think you're absolutely right that you should retain the full um, the full heavy set data we do almost in like a text file form. They're enormous files, but they're there, but it means we can open data that's a decade old. And as software updates and has, uh, as it gets, uh, cause it's updating all the time and we can do different things with them. We can take that original data and do incredible things with them. So yes, I think it's just keeping, keeping that uncompressed. Do you do similar things with the sound, James? Yes, and I mean it, it, it's exactly we we found a lot of what we were doing was was working out how are we how are we presenting this? What are we using it for? Our first iteration mm -hmm. of the project before we got the the follow on funding basically built a version where we didn't have to worry too much about any of this. We had a very nice gaming computer. We had a wired setup. It it didn't really matter how practical any of it was. Um, 
it, it sat in my office and that was fine. And I brought it out for conferences. I brought it out for teaching. I could tell people not to not to stand in front of the uh, of the infrared beam and, and ruin things. I, it was all great, um, except for it's fundamentally useless for, for you know, putting in a heritage site. Um, and that, that was one of the, one of the things that, that the guys in Glasgow really helped with was understanding actually what what you need to do to things to optimize it for that particular use. And then when we came to make the CD, of course, we realized that all of the optimizations were now wrong because mm. no one cares about you can't move anyway. So who, who cares about that? No, really, what you need is is the best possible musical output. Um, so I think part of it is keeping in mind what you actually want to use the thing for, because Yes, you've got to make fudges somewhere, um, but if you do them in the wrong place, you really undermine what you're doing. And there's often areas that you can do them in that no one is going to notice. So I, I think that's definitely the case. Keeping the data is really important um, because actually once you've built the thing, you can normally render it out in different ways for different yeah. uses. Um, and the big problem with all of this work, of course, is that as soon as you've finished it, it's become obsolete um, because they've suddenly brought out a new headset. Um, and suddenly you can do all the stuff which was impossible or which you spent a year trying and failed to do. And, and now it's, oh, I click that button. Great, done. Uh, so you can, I think you can almost um, paralyze yourself in worrying about be doing something that is out of date. Uh, you've just sort of got to do the best you can with it and always think, well, I could do it again with a different building when the technology's moved. Or fine, we revisit this project in five years and, and we update it. Um, you wouldn't have to start from scratch. Um, yeah. I think Lisa, Alice has her hands up for a while now. Lisa, can you ask your question? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, congratulations to um, both of you and your teams. Um, what an amazing project and so exciting in so many different ways. And I have, um, my question really is about how did you manage to do this? Um, sort of funding mechanisms and um, I'm thinking probably time was a huge commitment for both of you and your teams. So maybe just a few words about that. And congratulations again, really wonderful. James, you want to talk about the funding? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so yeah, we, we were funded uh, by the AHRC um, as part of sort of two tranches. Yeah. One of uh, the AHRC ran um, a, a themed call on a very, very, very short deadline um, that was about the audience of the future. And it was all about trying to take immersive technology. Yeah. One of their sort of areas of interest was performance. One of their areas of interest was heritage. Uh, and I think they were interested in what, what could you do with technology to try and do something about bringing new audiences in. I think some of this money was was made available sort of post Brexit when people started to realize the uh, impact that that would have. Um, so I think some of that money was was sort of made available in some sort of clearly failed attempt to ameliorate the, uh, the impact of that. Um, but so it was a themed call. We sort of plugged the thing that we'd been thinking about into that. There wasn't a vast amount of money, so it was sort of run as a pilot. Um, and then we had impact and engagement follow on funding, um, which was, again, a relatively small pot to sort of try and work what we'd got as as a concept and as a, a as, as a thing that just basically lived in my office um, into something that could have some kind of real world application. Um, the Yes, the money probably wasn't enough to do what we wanted to do. Um, I think it relied on a lot of goodwill from project partners who, who mucked in and did things um, very nicely for us. Um, it relied on a lot of time that was not costed, I think. Um, that said, I think I could do this again on a lot less money now because we sort of know what we're doing. Um, uh, but yeah, it was it was basically UK funding uh for it and it was about basically identifying the right call at the right moment i think not that many people managed to get a project together in time for it so uh we kind of were, were lucky on that uh but yeah it, it was a tricky one to bring together it relied a lot on goodwill as you'll have seen it required a lot on on big teams of people um and it required a lot of people doing things that were tricky i mean it helped that the ensemble we used I've worked with for a good decade or so, and I'm friends with a lot of them and the conductor. 
because I think had I done that to an ensemble I didn't know, they would have walked out um, just because it was such a horrible environment to perform in. So there was a lot of trust there that I hadn't gone insane um, and that this was a good idea. <laughs> and I think there was also a lot of trust from Historic Environment Scotland um, <laughs> that we weren't about to do something completely bonkers and that it was worth them putting their time in. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Sophia, have you got anything you want to add there? Yeah, yeah. in terms of time to get the data, um, which is my little, my little toe in this, in this ocean, it was less than a day on site and then uh, maybe like a week of post-processing um, on, on my part. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too onerous on that, but yeah, it did help that we already had the kit and the expertise and it's just a part of our remit anyway. So it's, it was a, it was a perfect storm, I think. Yeah, I think that, that is a big thing, making sure you've got the right experts in the right areas. <laughs> no one could do all of this on their own, I think. Um, but if you've got people for whom this yeah. is this is the day job and you can just bring enough of them together, you, you can make it work. Congratulations again, really wonderful. And amazing that historians and archeologists and you all working together, it's just a wonderful example, mm. that kind of interdisciplinary and kind of project. Robin? Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, coming at this from, uh, I, there's a lot of people in this room I don't know, and two that I do, Irma and Sophia, which is lovely. <laughs> and um, and, and um, coming at this from kind of the historian curatorial side, first of all, it's just amazing. I love seeing this stuff anyway. And, I, and, and being a nerd and being a nerd who gets to work with cool people like Sophia <laughs> on projects. So, so that's great. And the thing that struck me, I'm, you know, I'm such a, like sound just makes an experience just completely. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I've probably banged on to you about this, Sophia, but for me, I always go back, sorry, to the David Bowie exhibition at the v &A as such an amazing example of how sound creates just the most incredible. Now, obviously you have to have sound, it's Bowie. But what, what blew me away about it was that they didn't just give you an audio headset that you walk around and you, you find the chapter you wanna be on and stuff like most places are. That they had the money and the technology to make the sound move with you. And all you did was put on your headphones. And in fact, I went to the VNA Dundee this weekend to the night fever exhibition or last week. And we were a bit let down because it was just a silent disco and we wanted the kind of nightclub experience that it actually this the communal thing. And what Bowie did so well was because the sound went moved with you through space, you were having the same experience as whoever you were standing next to anyway, even though you were all in your own headphones and you weren't having to shuffle. And as you moved, it faded out and faded into the next thing. Okay. So that's my setup comment for, oh my God, I love how you moved in the VR and the sound shifted. I want to do that in Lilithgow. I haven't been over there. So I don't know how much of this is actually active and live there. And, um, and can we just start doing that everywhere, please? Can we record more of these soundtracks essentially? So when we go into any castle I, here, who can I call? Shall I call up you and Sophia and be like, yes, <laughs> where's the budget for this? <laughs> it's there, right? We so much. much. <laughs> we want to start. Yeah. Yeah. Can we want to start putting this in? But it's just so amazing. So I guess yeah. kind of my question is about the feasibility. And is it, I don't know, is it RFID? I'm making up terms now. Like what's the, you know, of, of how can we do this and safely do it as well? for us moving around to, to experience sound as we move through space and the sound moves with us and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I'll speak a little bit first because I, I hesitate to comment because it's not my expertise, but our interpretation team has had that in their head for a while, actually. They've got a sound guy um, and it's, it is so evocative. I think it was at St. Andrew's, it was Castle, St. Andrew's Castle where it was RFID, where you had a, um, your audio tour would trigger based on where you were going around in the space. Um, and I love the idea of it giving you a group experience because especially with digital heritage, group and collaborative experience is so rare. 
Um, because I mean, a lot of interpretation is solo, even though you go to these places as group, um, they're always either quietly reading or you've got a headset on by yourself or you're listening to something by yourself. So ways in, we, in which we can develop the conceit of, of having these shared experiences on site, I think the more the merrier. And I think that's a really beautiful example um, of it, the Bowie exhibition, because it's the same kind of kit that we're used to, yeah. um, but it tells it just ever so slightly and cleverly. Um, but yeah, James, do you want to <laughs> talk to so it? This, this is something I, I, I've, I've been wanting to explore a little bit. And again, we just ran out of time, but um, yeah. when, when I went to demo this in uh, South by Southwest in, te in Texas, I met the guys from Bose who, had just brought out their Bose AR sunglasses um, and somehow I managed to wrangle a free pair <laughs> of these <laughs> by saying I would develop something for it uh, which I then haven't got around to doing yet but um, what you can do with those which I really want to do is just drop your file from Unreal or Unity into it with the sound obviously there's no visuals but mm. it's it, it, it has you know different sound in each ear it goes directly into your ear if you map your your um your virtual version of Linlithgow Palace Chapel, for instance, which which we've got, uh, if we map that in and drop that in with the sound experience, whack the head back your sunglasses on with the headphones essentially in there, you can walk around the space, and it will move with you, and it will work out the spatialization of the acoustics, etc. Um, so I think the technology exists to do this. Um, whether or not you're going to be able to give every visitor 150 pound um sunglasses uh, and not have them run away with them is a different question uh, but i think the technology is there taking something an approach to that that you could do with just you know um very very cheap cardboard versions of those or something or i suppose making sure there's someone on the gate to rugby tackle people who are running off with it um that would work but yeah, the technology is there. You could definitely do it. I'd love to do it. It's just something we never got around to doing. Um, but if you built um, a VR experience like this and you had access to these sunglasses or something similar, um, you basically don't really have to do very much to just drop the experience from one onto the other. Um, so it's probably a, a relatively easy win if you wanted to do that. Uh, I mean, at the moment, the Linlithgow experience um, well, actually, at the moment, the Linlithgow experience is in my spare bedroom um, because it's all, all shut due to COVID. Um, but once we can get it on site, once we've got the green light again from health and safety, um, it will be there. But it will be in, sort of in the undercroft space at the bottom um, mm -hmm. because that was the most appropriate space. So it's slightly odd in that you're not in the chapel whilst you're virtually in the chapel. It would be really nice to be able to do some version of it in the chapel. Walk through Obviously. the chapel. And, and as we get closer to the guys singing. Exactly. Like that's yeah. it. I mean, that's really amazing. And I'm just curious about the Bose ones because I've used Google Glass and, mm. and I really like it because obviously you're seeing the real world and yeah. the and it's so good for people who get slightly nauseous at the cardboard. Mm. Um, so why I hope, well, I don't hope for a corporate read. I don't know. But Google Glass and a Bose sunglasses need to get together, it seems. Mm -hmm. create that but they surely have like surely that yeah. is out yeah there. I, mean, I, I don't think any of this is is stuff that's not going to be around very very shortly um yeah, yeah it, and it, it's one of these things where you know when we were looking at developing this bit it was all really new now it's not all really new um so I, I think a future project I'd just write that in from the start um mm -hmm. and frankly if if the tech didn't exist you could probably hire a postdoc who could make it happen relatively simply um i think we're, we're really not far from it in an in an r d sense i think uh and I'm, I'm sure it's out there and has been developed in the last few months whilst i've not paid attention um <laughs> but yeah it, it's it's really powerful the ability to do that kind of thing it helps because obviously if you've got if you've got a vr headset on you can't be walking around the actual chapel because you'd fall out of a window and die um it, it would be an absolute nightmare uh, yeah. It's got to be a sat experience, otherwise, otherwise you're getting sued a lot. Um, oh, okay. Steve has Steve has uh, I think just put oh, in a link there in the chat to it. Thanks, Steve. Um, so yeah, it, it's great to have something like that. It gives you an experience you can do actually in the same space 
and you can move yourself rather than moving your avatar. It would be great. Also, like, I don't want to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I don't want to like bring it there, but there is a lot of discourse in the VR world about like post plague times and how feasible mm. it is that people are going to want to stick their head in a little thing that however many p- strangers have stuck their head in, which is a yep. little bit of like a no, <laughs> but <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's something to keep in mind. So having own devices or, you know, something that's easier to clean than a whole headset I yeah it could be a something to that we're gonna have to keep in mind going forward um but I'm aware yeah. someone's got their hand up so I'll pass this on but I was just say at the VNA you know they gave you little booty covers for the like the you know sure. you cover your shoes when you go in yes headphones yes but you were still putting on all the headphones and and it was also then you had to stand and put little covers on it just I know and I got it, but it was just, I know. Sucks. Well, yeah. Shock. So I, I, this will be another thing that drives us forward. So anyway, thank yeah. you guys. It's an amazing project. Thank oh, you. pleasure, Robin. On scene. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Irma. Uh, thank you so much, Sophia and James. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, both from the computational side and the acoustics, it's so interesting. I, I do have a kind of, um, more uh, sound-based question. Actually, I'm uh, singing in a choir myself as a soprano, well, pre-COVID. Mm. <laughs> and that was, um, I, I really recognize what you said about singing in the bathroom or in a cathedral. I've heard the director say so many times, don't sing lazily now that we're in the, in the concert hall, you know, don't start singing lazy. Um, and I was wondering actually, if you have, of course, this is an amazing reconstruction and it's amazing too. Uh, be able to experience this on site. But I was also wondering this kind of what you said in the beginning about how the composer wanted it to to sound. So I was wondering if you have considered or are considering um, using this for educational purposes as well. Mm -hmm. For example, for like smaller um, ensembles that want to sing certain music, uh, but would like to know how it would actually have sounded when they perform it in a more modern situation now? Yes, so it, it's part of the reason that we wanted to release the CD sort of commercially in that it's a bit of a shot across the bow for, for, for the commercial recording. I mean, it's a very small commercial recording world. Uh, the the, the number, of, number of people buying medieval Renaissance music on CD, is, yeah, is, is, is relatively limited, um, <laughs> if I'm honest, but still. Um, yeah, we, we wanted to get it out commercially and, you know, the, the, the liner notes are very clear of this isn't going to sound anything like what what you are expecting, but we think this is closer to how it should sound. Um, and we were expecting a lot, it, we were expecting a lot of negative reviews to that because it was a, a, a bit of a shot across the bow to, to sort of common practice. And actually, it's been really, really well reviewed. And we went to number two in the charts and things. And it, it's gone down really well. So what I'm hoping is that, that people will, will take on the sort of mantle that we've thrown down and try to record in smaller spaces with more padding, essentially, to try and get a little bit closer to that. I think what, what you hear is a lot more of the counterpoint. Uh, you don't just get this wash of sound. You can actually identify what different voices are doing. And that's really cool. Um, so yeah, I, I think we we hoped that that other groups, other professional groups, might go on and say, okay, you've tried this, we're going to go and do it better, and that would be awesome. Um, and yeah, I, I I hadn't really considered it about it for for sort of amateur choirs and things like that. I obviously I use it at, at work, I use it when I teach at university. Um, but yeah, that idea actually of of trying to get that out for for amateur choirs is is a good idea. Um, and seeing what people could kind of run this, with. Uh, because I was especially amazed by the difference in sound that, of course, they tell you that there is a difference, but I, I found that very, very funny to hear as well, the difference between the three sounds that you uh, um, recorded. Is that available somewhere as well? Or because I, I think on the CD you said it's mainly the, well, the old so, acoustics, right? Yeah, so the CD has um, the the early 16th century acoustic and yes. uh, as right. on, on the burnt CD version, but you download an app with that. And from that app, you can hear it with the present day acoustic and the past acoustic, and you can just switch between the two. Um, so you can definitely hear that as part mm-hmm. of it. Um, 
if you really want the anechoic version as well, just drop me an email and I'll send it to you. <laughs> um, but we, we didn't put that out on the CD because I think probably the choir would have murdered me if yes, I did. Um, I can imagine they wouldn't like it. But so actually, exposed. you can hear how well they sing, right? <laughs> oh, you, you can. Yeah. I mean, the, um, yeah, I, I think it, it reminded me just how good they are. The fact mm -hmm. that, that you can hear everything. <laughs> yes. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Any further questions, comments? Lawrence. Hi, um, I kind of have a question mainly for Sophia, um, given that, that you're, I, I work in, in conservation architecture in, in England mm -hmm. and um, we handle a lot of, well, we, we don't handle, our surveyors handle a lot of uh, point cloud information, a lot of data. And, um, part, part of what I've been doing recently has been uh, trying to get the, the group of people we work with in a project to, to use the 3D information a lot more. Um, and so this, this can be sort of 3D printing, sort of like looking at it in virtual reality as well. Yeah. And, and, and one of the sort of uh, challenges that I think that I'm going to be having um, with with, um, with our clients it is how they use the data. Um, and so say so takes, for instance, um, we, we aren't involved with this, but uh, Peterborough Cathedral, they've just done this fantastic um, 3D scan of their whole yeah. cathedral. Yeah. Um, and, and I've had a chat with the surveyors who did that, and it's an absolutely fantastic um, data set. And it's, it's going to be one of those ones like, going forward that is, is, is referenced to, I, I think. And um, the problem is where... Uh, where does that data go now? Like, where does it, it, it live? What, what happens to it? Like, it sits on a hard drive. Um, uh, and I mean, in my, my case, like, I go back to stuff that's maybe six years old and I try and, and use it and, it and it can't really be used and it's difficult and it, and it doesn't work. And so in the end, I have to give up um, due to sort of time constraints and things. I think my question is, is there, do you use, because you, you are one of these people who's going to be using this information far more than other people. Like far yeah. more, do you have a, a method by which you, you can archive it safely if that's the way yeah that oh my gosh Lawrence like the amount of times where you have a gorgeous data set and people just want a 2d output is like <laughs> it's great because it, it does make gorgeous 2d outputs you can do CAD drawings for architects it's it's an incredible resource but it does from the 3d side you're like but so the ways in which we kind of combat it in terms of to, to encourage other people to use it depends on its output. So Sketchfab, as I mentioned, is a really great resource for folk to be able to interrogate 3D models when they're not used to it. Um, but if, you, if you're talking to architects who want the measurements and the, the kind of crunchy detail of the point cloud without kind of any decimation, um, which we were talking about to bring it over to like a gaming environment, I would recommend looking at Portree um, it's a, I can, once I stop talking, I'll pop it in the chat. Um, but that's an open source, uh, sort of 3d viewer that just, um, uh, you can view point clouds in it and it's really slick. Um, it's been around for a while and when nice open source things have been around for a while, it, it, it's, it's really come into its own. So that is a really great way of allowing people to interact with, a 3D point cloud on their browser because otherwise we would have had to give them the software to download and the data in a hard drive and it's um, they just would like why would you go to all you know it's it's just too much trouble for them to to handle um, in terms of what how we save our point clouds usually we um, do several different um, outputs usually E57 and PTX um, are good sort of future like future. Um, proofing ways to save out a point cloud. Um, you do have to be prepared for the file sizes. Um, we have, uh, we're very lucky to have um, servers, two of them that are backed up um, with all of our terabytes upon terabytes of data. Um, but that is something to keep in mind when you're dealing with this kind of stuff um, because they're huge that it can yeah, and then when you add the photography and all that other kind of things that you'll need, um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. But in terms of having a point cloud um, that you can measure 
um, uh, measurements off of and be able to manipulate it in space and, and kind of slice it in half if you need to. And um, it's, yeah, that's what we're working on kind of in-house for, for our, uh, for conservation decision management purposes. I, so. I think, I think one, one of my other parts of my question is, yeah, uh, it's to do with the, the thought that um, if I go, say, if I go into Winchester Cathedral, I can go into the archive and I can find a beautiful drawing from 700 years ago, um, showing, showing an elevation of the, of the cathedral. Um, but if I ask the archivist for the point cloud from five years ago from, that the surveyor did, it, it's, yeah. it's a very difficult thing to sort of be able to achieve. And, and I expect as we go further in, into sort of the territory of 3D scanning where, where we're heading, um, it'll, get, it'll get easier. Um, but I, I was kind of wondering, is there any standard documentation, any standard um, form that is published by, by organisations such as yours? Um, but, in yeah. terms of in terms of archiving 3D data, in, yeah, in terms of that kind of thing, I don't want to say yes for my organization, but I may <laughs> be missing a trick. Um, do, you, do you guys have one? Do you guys have a standard form that that everyone uses? Or so is it we we have like I would point you towards the ADS um, because they in terms of 3D data, it's they don't just they deal mainly with sort of all they almost popped in the jungle. Um, one second. So the archaeological data service, they're in terms of archiving, they're the kind of golden standard. Um, they deal with some 3D data, but not all. I'm going to double check <laughs> with my organization because I could, I, I don't think so. We um, kind of have metadata and, and a standard of, um, of archiving within our team, but I'm not sure. ADS is definitely a really a really great place to start but if not like get in contact with me on, on twitter or something and i, okay, I can great. answer you more shortly <laughs> thank, thank you for your answer oh no no that's great thank you thank you so much for your more questions we are reaching half past five I'm, i have three questions on my list but maybe leads too far. Are there other um, comments otherwise? So I, I would be interested, so uh, that relates also to, to Lawrence's question, about, uh, maybe I missed that point. So uh, uh, is the data uh, available? So the, the raw data somewhere? Uh, so both, so the, the audio data and the, the, the 3D data, that would be the first question. I, I, uh, and then the, an, another question is about uh, what um, uh, the, the tile moved. Lisa uh, uh, pointed to the, the community. So how much exchange is there in the community? So there's, I mean, you have liturgists, you have musicologists, audio engineers, you have um, uh, historians, archi architects, uh, architect, and, um, and archaeologists. And I know of so one project, for example, in, in Tübingen, I think, is also about reconstructing audio and performances in, in churches of, um, um, uh, in France, medieval France. Um, is there exchange? So um, I think um, this is really innovative and, uh, and pushing forwards um, various disciplines. And, uh, and that leads to my third question about research. Oh, James already said you would use the results also in, in university teaching. But what uh, new knowledge is being produced by this collaboration? Is there a new, can you draw conclusions about the fragmentarity of, of the music that has survived? Uh, in, in, in documentation from, from that uh, day. So the three questions. So the data, the community, and the, um, um, the uh, research output, so, so to say, of knowledge that is being created. Sorry, it's maybe a bit too much for a yeah, finish. No, no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so if you can so be short on this. Yeah. In, in terms of the, vis the visual, sort of visual data, the scanning and things, I'll, I'll leave that to Sophia to answer. Um, I think we, we'd be very, very happy to share the acoustic model that we've made. We probably can't share the recordings because I, it's commercial agreement with Hyperion um, that they, they put money in and, and need, to, need to make their money back, essentially. Uh, but in terms of the acoustic, yes, 
we could share that. Um, I will at some point get around to putting that up um, on our website um, because there's absolutely no reason that people can't can't explore the acoustic um, models, essentially. Um, I'll let Sophia answer about, about sort of the point cloud data and things. Um, I think we're quite happy for people to have access to the finished virtual reality stuff as well. Um, online, there are, as we've already alluded to, there are difficulties as to what's the best way of doing that. There is a version of it on YouTube, which is sort of direct video out rendering, um, which is used as part of a, a QR code on site, but other people can, can access as well. Um, in terms of the community, uh, yes, there, there are lots of people working in this now. Um, I think some of the earliest projects came out of Tour. Um, they've, got a t they've got a center there that's done some really, really interesting stuff over the years. I think probably their, their earliest experiments with this were maybe nearly 10 years ago now um, and started with much more of the acoustic stuff and, and started moving into, into acoustic and visual. Um, there's another project in Sweden uh, which I've been involved as, as a consultant on a little bit uh, as they started just after we did. Um, and sort of we've been able, I've been able to say, don't do that. We did it and it didn't work, um, <laughs> which is handy. But again, they, what they were trying to create is something very different. They're not intending it to be part of um, a sort of heritage site. They're building it purely for research. So their priorities are, are completely different and the, their approaches therefore have been led by different approaches. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of us starting to do these things and we're sort of uh, starting to share um, workflows and models. The big difficulty is that tech just keeps changing. So the, the stuff that works five years ago ends up being very different. Um, uh, what was the other question? Oh yes, um, what we've learned. Um, various things, again, for various different um, outputs I think from sort of a, a performance side of things from the side early music performance I think we've learned a lot about how the acoustic functions we've learned a lot about what these spaces sounded like which I don't think we really knew quite so vividly before we've learned a lot about how different types of music sound within those spaces and that I think tells us some things about placement of singers and number of singers um, it, it helps to explain various phenomena better. Um, in terms of understanding the space there, actually it was very interesting. We tried to put choir stalls in, for instance, and we struggled because we couldn't find a way to do it and have people be able to move in the liturgical space. So we took them out, um, which was possibly the wrong decision. I'm still very ambiguous. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was the right thing to do, but um, until we actually tried to put avatars in the space and have them move and have them sing, I didn't realize quite that the room couldn't function the way I envisaged it, it would. Um, so definitely it teaches you something about experimental sort of layouts of rooms. That's quite useful. Uh, and it does allow you to test hypotheses, um, I think about sort of standing building archeology span in interesting ways. Uh, has it told me anything about the sort of fragmentary nature of Scottish music of the period? Only accidentally, um, in that I came across the two mass cycles that I've ended up writing a lot about and deciding that I think are the earliest surviving Scottish mass cycles because it was repertoire that made sense to perform. But I believed, as everyone else did, that they were continental works that happened to have turned up in Scotland um, and yeah, incidentally, through having to research them, I think I've proven that that's definitely not the case um, and that they're at least possibly Scottish. Uh, so, yeah, only accidentally. Um, but I think it, it has pushed our understanding in a lot of different ways. Um, I think with a bit more funding and a bit more time, it could push things in a lot more ways. Uh, I do think a bit more focus on acoustics could be very useful in ludomusicology uh, and in, in gaming. Um, I think we probably could apply some of what we've done within those kind of workflows to make some more accurate and, and more functional uh, acoustics in gaming. Sorry, I hope that answered all three questions. Absolutely, completely. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Excellent. And <laughs> Sophia, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you might want to... Um, you might want to say something about the, the sort of accessibility of point cloud data and things. Oh, for sure, for sure. So yes, we have all of the data here. And actually, since the 
we, we um, got the model that we handed over to James's team. It's been privately up on Sketchfab. Um, but the reason why it's remained private is because without the music and the sound, the story of that little vignette of, of the Lutka Palace is incomplete. It doesn't, I mean, it's a beautiful model, but not quite, I, I don't know. So, so we have scanned after this project, we have scanned the Lipco in full. So when that data um, has been fully processed and, and gone through the sort of the workflow that we discussed at the beginning of this, that will be available um, uh, up on Sketchfab to be able to interrogate and learn. But if you're interested in, in the, the private model, I'd be happy to share it privately. Um, but that's why it hasn't necessarily been published because without the sound and the reconstruction, if you came across the model by itself, you'd be like, well, thank you for these two rooms <laughs> in, this, in this huge site. Um, so that's the reasoning behind that. But yeah, just let me know. Um, yeah. Daniel, do you, have, do you have a question before we go? Yes, hello. Uh, Hi. First off, thanks uh, for both of you, uh, both uh, Sophia and James. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's a sen sensory, sensory uh, a joy, it's a bit, mm. you know. Um, I have one question for both of you. Myself, I'm a, a material scientist um, and I do a, some work with um, uh, uh, materials in arch art and archaeology, uh, namely photogrammetry. Um, and worked with that in the past, but never, never so much with lasers. And I, I noticed on one of, um, uh, of the model you did, you, you both used the, the laser to begin with to get the, 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 the solid model because it doesn't yeah. produce the texture. And then you use some photogrammetry to, to get this texture. Is there any reason why you didn't use the, the photogrammetry as well uh, for, for the model? Because I know yeah. it generates a model. And, and then the follow-up question to that would be, um, how do you go about merging? Is, is it pretty easy merging this, um, the, the laser data um, to the, the photogrammetry data? Yeah, well, it's it, the software makes it easy. You will say that's a great. They're great questions, absolutely. So, um, with photogrammetry, sometimes, especially with objects, we just purely do photogrammetry and keep the laser scanning um, to to the more you know sites and, and rooms like that. So, our workflow kind of works like laser scanning as you know to make it the the real size model because it's the exact geometry of the space. Whereas sometimes photogrammetry, you have to um, uh, scale it um, yeah. later on. So that kind of gives us the scale, the real world, world scale to work with. Uh, photogrammetry is great for filling in gaps that the laser scanner misses. So when we apply that to the um, workflow on site, it gives us that kind of you know filling in of the nooks and crannies that might've been missed. Uh, we use color in the scan because in reality capture, uh, you need the color scan in order to align the photos and the, the laser scans. So essentially what you do is you import the scan, import the photos, press a line, <laughs> cross your fingers. <laughs> and if it doesn't work out initially, then you use pick points in similar ways. You say this, picture, this point in the picture is the same as this point in the scan and you tie it all together really nicely. Um, and then it shows the scans and the scene and the photographs. Uh, and then usually just because of the scale, um, we'll mesh it using primarily laser scan data. Um, and if there are, and we can tell the software to use, oh, it missed this bit. Can you use these pictures for geometry as well? And it can. Um, we can, and then we can use and we can tell it to use just the photographs for the texture. When we were scanning with a thermal camera attached to our laser scanner, then we said, please use the scans to texture the scans and it had thermal data applied. Um, so if you've played around with reality capture a little bit, um, there are many, many different tiny buttons <laughs> and many different things that you, you know, put numbers in you're like, mm, maybe this. Yeah. And then, so there's a lot of different things to tweak with, but generally, um, that's how it works. Uh, that's our, our usual workflow um, in combining laser scanners and uh, photogrammetry. We are very lucky that we have a team that has been doing this for a decade. Uh, so over time, we have amassed multiple laser scanners and very expensive pieces of kit that are just not feasible for a lot of teams. Um, so there's nothing wrong with good photogrammetry um, that has been um, scaled and you know, with, with good sharp images 
that's that's an excellent workflow for 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 3D data. So yeah, that's that was our reasoning behind behind that. That answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks. And uh, yeah. just a quick one for for James. Um, I saw, you saw the 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 model as it was put in, and you had how the the the, the sound was interacting with the of the walls and of of the ceiling. Um, I, I wasn't so sure in your presentation whether or not it it takes into consideration what materials that so it um so you know like that how a sound interact uh, would interact with stone compared to how it would interact with the, the wooden ceiling or perhaps like um if there was any 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 cloths or any windows uh yes so so that that that's what poor rod had to spend a lot of time doing was tagging all of the surface areas with their materialities so um e exactly that part of the reason that 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 sounds like such an intimate space is that the front and back walls are entirely draped in cloth, which is quite heavy. Um, so basically the singers are facing the altar and therefore facing a giant dampener and they just sing into it. Um, so it, it's part of the reason that we don't get, we don't get as much reverberation in that space as you'd expect. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, if, if we'd just done the geometry of it, um, we, it would have sounded very, very different if if we'd just assumed it was all glass or something. Um, so yeah, basically Odeon has quite good um, data for various types of material. It, it, it has sort of presets for all of those. Um, so it's got a good sense of what oak sounds like. Well, not sounds like, but what, what oak does to sound in a particular configuration in terms of what frequencies it's going to absorb, which ones it's going to, to scatter and how. Um, so yeah, it, it was very important that we did that. Um, we you, we probably could have been more accurate with it if we'd had more time and more money, as ever. Um, and there are you know there there's probably more work that could be done there in terms of um, looking at some historical materials a bit more, uh, which are, you're less likely to find commercially available um, figures for. Um, but I mean, you you can derive all of that yourself if you want to and that that can be done thank you for that uh, thank you again for your presentation thank you well thank you all i think we, we uh, people start to leave because we're already going over time but that shows that there's a very interesting discussion going on um so thank you all for uh, being here and thanks for to our wonderful speakers and thank you for hanging in there so long uh, Sophia and James to answer the questions uh, I think it was a really interesting and important discussion um, so this is the end of our series um, and um, I think it has been a very good one uh, this recording too uh, this this uh, uh, seminar will too be available as a recording on the YouTube channel. Uh, there will be a, a blog post on it as well, which will uh, contain all the links to the recording. And uh, we will ask uh, links from uh, Sophia and James to uh, imaging and so on to put in so you can all look at it at ease. Uh, so thank you again. Um, uh, and um, well, we hope to organize another series of technical art history meetings after the summer. So maybe see some of you back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, wonderful audience, wonderful presentations, uh, wonderful presentators. And yeah, thank you also for Elisa for working in the background, mm. and for creating the actual video. So that will be very useful. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, watch the spot. So when Emma creates a new <laughs> program for the next academic year, so that I'm, I'm sure that will be exciting again.